does that music say? Yes, sir, Amos. That music say, Good health to all from Rexall. <laughs> Show transcribed with Ernestine Wade, Lou Lubin, Johnny Lee, John Brown, Will Wright, Roy Glenn, Jeff Alexander's music, and radio's all time favorites, Amos and Andy. <laughs> It's supper time in the Stevens household, and the Kingfish has returned home ravenously hungry as usual. He is already at the table as his wife, Sapphire, serves him with the main course of the meal. He eagerly takes his first bite, and then he starts frowning. Sapphire, what kind of meat is this, anyway? It's lamb, George. Lamb? I must be chewing on some of the wool here. <laughs> Listen, George, stop complaining. That's lamb shanks. And with the four dollars a week I have for food, I can't buy no higher up on animals. <laughs> That ain't no excuse. The food down here is getting to be just plain bad. It's getting so I take them a bicarbonate before the meal so my stomach can get a head start on the indigestion. That's enough, George. And that beef soup that you've been serving is something, too. It ain't got no taste no more. Well, what do you expect? I had to use the same soup bone eight times. <laughs> All right, then. Don't make no more. If that soup bone you got is, is done woe out, switch to something else. <laughs> Why don't you make some of that tomato soup you made three, four times last week? We need a new tomato, too, George. <laughs> you know, George, if you would only get a job and go to work... Wait a minute. Somebody at the door. Let me peek through the lace curtain here and see who it is. <laughs> who is it, George? Uh-huh. Just what I thought. It's that same process server. He been trying to serve me with a summons for three months for not paying the grocery bill. But he ain't never gonna catch me. Well, what do we do? Well, now, look here, here. I'll hide behind the sofa, and you tell him that I just left for Europe. George, this is the last time I'm ever going to do anything like this for you. Go ahead, Sapphire. You've got to do it. Yes? Uh, I'd like to get some information about George Stevens. Well, the last time I seen him, he said he was going to Europe. Europe? Three weeks ago when I was here, you told me he just died. <laughs> yes, ain't that penicillin wonderful? <laughs> Nice work, honey. That was nice work. Listen, George Stevens, this is the last time I'm going to do anything like this for you. i got to go in and get dressed for a meeting at the women's club now, but I'm warning you, if you don't do something about getting a job, I'm going to do something desperate. Something desperate. Do you hear? Something desperate. Hmm. Maybe she means it. <laughs> I see Betty Davis talk that way in a picture once, and she went out and threw herself under the 20th Century Limited. <laughs> Oh, come in, Kingfish. I was surprised to see you down here at the lodge hall this evening. Yeah, well, then, the Sapphire went to a meeting at the women's club. On top of that, we done had a fight. She heckled me about not having no money, and there's a process server chasing after me, too, you know. Yeah, well, you know, I've been thinking about making some money myself. I ain't done nothing since 1938. <laughs> and I never like to lay off more than ten years at a time. <laughs> You don't want to get rusty, you know. No. Yeah, your mind liable to mold up on you, and you'll end up having your brain look like a hunk of fuzzy Liederkranz cheese. You say that Sapphire went to a meeting of the women's club this evening, huh? Yeah, I don't know why she hang out with that mob. Ain't nothing but a bunch of overripe bobby socks. <laughs> Hand me that phone, and I think I'll call up at the women's club and see what time she's coming home. Maybe I can pick her up. Yeah. And maybe me and you can go in the meeting room and watch the television until it's time to pick up. Yeah. Wait a minute. Now, hello, women's club. Uh, this is Mr. Steven. Say, uh, my wife ain't in the middle of no hen fight over there. Could I speak to her, please? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Mrs. Steven. Well, she's one of the members there. What you mean there ain't no meeting tonight? <laughs> There's a meeting every Thursday night. What's that? Oh, tonight is Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Now, that's funny, ain't it? She told me there was a woman's club meeting. I called a woman's club and said there ain't no meeting. Well, maybe she's at some other kind of meeting. What you driving at, Dan? Well, 
Maybe Sapphire is seeing a masculine gender of the neuter sex. <laughs> and is you implying that she is galvanizing around with a man? I don't mean no kangaroo. <laughs> and I relents the application coming from you, my dear friend, inferring that my wife would stoop to a thing like that. My bride of 22 years. You think there's any chance in it? Well, I don't know. Hard to say what some fellas go for. I seen a fellow once in the circus. He got a big kick out of hitting himself over the head with a mallet. Yeah, but a guy would have to hit himself over the head pretty hard before he'd get goofy enough to go out with my way, wouldn't he? Yeah, you're right. That face of hers is really death to romance if I ever seed one. Come on in the other room and watch television. Yeah, chances are they're holding the women's meeting at another place because Sapphire never lies to me. Nah. Worried about nothing here. Ha-ha. <laughs> <laughs> well, look here. I guess none of the brothers is around. Turn the set on, Kingfish. Yeah. Yeah, let it warm up there. You know something, Kingfish? This television is wonderful. But there's one thing I can never understand. How do the station ever send a picture through the air and have it come out on the set? Well, that's simple, and it? It's uh, done with electronics. Oh, yeah, yeah, I heard about that. Uh, what is this electronic stuff? What is it? What is it? Yeah. Well, it's one of the tronics. <laughs> There's all kind of tronics. There's electronics, gas tronics, hair tronics. We got everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you see, uh... At the studio, they turn the tronics into watts, and then they jams the watts through the ossifier, and it preambulates the picture through the vehicular tube on your set, you see? <laughs> the next thing you know, Milton Burl is jumping and screaming right in your face. <laughs> yeah, well, ain't nothing on that channel, Kingfish. Switch the thing. Yeah. Well, there, we're getting something there now. Look at that. Uh, good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to our Round the Town television program, brought to you nightly from the Colonial Restaurant, Harlem's Smartest Eating Spot. And now, before we watch the floor show, let's swing our cameras around the room and watch the merry, merry crowd who are having dinner with us here this evening. Yeah. Hey, look how plain you can see the people's faces. Oh, yeah. The show with the crowd, ain't it? Yeah. Ha, ha. Look at that. Look at that good-looking fellow at the corner table. He must be taking his mother-in-law out. She is really a toad, ain't she? <laughs> yeah. Ha, ha, ha. She really got a fa- uh. Wait a minute, Andy. <laughs> that toad happens to be my wife. <laughs> That's Sapphire. Holy smokes, and she's with another man. Andy, how do you like that two-timing woman? She told me that she was going to the women's club. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's bring on the master of ceremony. Cut off that thing quick, Andy. <laughs> oh, me, Andy. My wife out with another man. This is a terrible situation. I'll say it is. The chances is that fellow escaped from some kind of an institution. <laughs> I tell you, Brother Crawford, it's disgraceful. I was sitting there with Mrs. Van Porter when it come on plain as day. There on the screen was the kingfish's wife having dinner with a strange man. Yes, Henry, we saw it too, and believe me, it made my wife very unhappy. Oh, I... Yeah, Fred, we seated right there on the tube. Sapphire sitting there with another fella. Well, being a newspaper man, that sure is a tidbit for me. I'll slap it right in my column. It'll be one of them five what items. I'll say something like, what wife or what well-known character was seen with what bistro with what unknown man, and what's going on? Last time I printed an album like that, three fellas shot their wives. Oh. Amos, I don't care if people is talking. They're just going to have to talk. And I don't want you to say nothing to nobody. Well, Sapphire, now that you done told me that the man you had dinner with was your cousin Harry from out of town, I, I understand the whole thing. Yes, you see, Amos, his company's opened a new branch here in New York, uh -huh. and I'm trying to get him to give George a job. I had to tell George I was going to the women's club, else he'd have got wise to what's going on. Yeah, and you don't want the kingfish to find out till the job's all set, because he's really allergic to work already, ain't he? He sure is. Until the whole thing comes out, people's just going to have to talk and gossip. I ain't going to let nothing spoil this. 
George has just got to make some money. I'm tired of having people serving us with summonses. Yes, Andy, when I got home last night, I put Sapphire to the test. I said very casual like to her, I say, uh, how was everything at the meeting? And without batting an eye, she come right back at me with, oh, it was one of the most charming meetings we ever had. Yeah. <laughs> then she lied the dart into the bedroom and left me standing there with my mouth open like a gaff flounder. <laughs> yeah. Well, we seen her with the fellow on television, all right, and I know that wasn't no optical transfusion. <laughs> Tell me this. You got any idea who the fellow was? Yeah, I talked to the man who owns the restaurant this morning. He said the fellow's name is Harry Smith. And he's from out of town, and he's staying over at the Palace Hotel. Oh, this is something, ain't it, Andy? Yeah, it's a mess, all right, after you being married all these years. Yeah, Andy, uh, and they say a man's home is his castle. But it looked like the old gal has been letting down the drawbridge on me here. <laughs> Kingfish, I tell you that... Uh-oh, look who's coming across the street. Shorty the barber. Oh, me... I don't want to see nobody right now. I'm so embarrassed over this thing. Look, Andy, don't mention nothing to him about this thing with Sapphire in front of Shorty. You know, uh, he ain't heard about my wife running around with another man. Yeah, okay. Well, come in, Shorty. What you doing on the large hall? Uh, I, I, just, I just dropped in because I, I, I came over to pass the time. I, I just wanted to say that. I, I just wanted to ask that. If, I, 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 is Sapphire doing anything tomorrow night? <laughs> So you was heard about it too, huh, Shorty? Yeah, that's the best subject we've had in the barbershop in a long time. <laughs> well, Shorty, uh, what is I going to do about it? I found out who the fella is, but I don't know how to handle a situation like this. Well, the best thing is to get the fella out of town. Yeah, but uh, if he's crazy about my wife, he ain't going to leave town. Yeah, and she must be crazy about him too, because he's such a good-looking fella. He's even better looking than I is. Yeah, I, I noticed he was good-looking. He was the best-looking man over the... Uh, I, say, wait a minute. Movie talent scouts is always searching for good-looking fellas to send out to Hollywood. Yeah, but we don't know no movie talent scouts. Uh, we ain't a queen. Uh, we, uh, we, uh... And the old boy, <laughs> you may not know it, but as of right now, we is in the movie business. <laughs> Look here, if we offered him a part out in Hollywood, he'd probably jump at the chance. Yeah, you think he'd fall for it, huh, Shorty? Oh, yeah, yeah. Everybody has a secret ambition to be an actor. Well, I even had the lead in that great stage play once called uh, The Bluebird. Shorty, you played the lead in The Bluebird? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll never forget my big scene. I was dressed in feathers just like a bird. They, 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 they were going to swing me across the audience on the wire just, just, just like a bird. And I, I was going to sing like a bird. I, I, I was going to do everything just like a bird. Oh, well, uh, how'd you make out, Shorty? Oh, I was a big success. I, I, I was sensational. I was stupendous. I, I, I was the hit of the... I, 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 I laid an egg. <laughs> Now, Andy, before I knock on Mr. Smith's door here, remember now, we as big movie mongrels from Hollywood. Yeah, I got you, Kingfish. Go ahead and knock. Go ahead. Right. Now, don't forget, I is the producer of the picture, and you is the writer. And when you talk, mention them big pictures like uh, Panic in the Streets and the Halls of Montezuma and that stuff. Uh, yes, gentlemen? Uh, how you do, Mr. Smith? Uh, pardon our berets and putties, but uh, we just in from Hollywood. We represent the big picture studio. Oh, well, won't you come in? Yes, sir. Allow me to introduce ourselves. I is the chief producer, and this gentleman with me here is Mr. Cecil B. DeBrown. <laughs> he is my director, scenario writer, and chauffeur. Here, here, here. Yeah, we is both just in from the Cinnamon City. Why, it's a pleasure to meet a real Hollywood director and writer. Uh, what can I do for you? Well, Mr. Smith, uh, you'll be glad to hear that uh, one of our talent scouts has recommended you for a part in our next big picture. Yeah. We is here to sign you up. <laughs> Boy, I'm not an actor. You want to sign me up for pictures? That's right, yes, sir. And Mr. Brown here will write the picture uh, that you're going to be in. CB, tell the gentleman about the last two pictures you scenarioed up. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, the first one was the big hit, Pancakes in the Street. No. <laughs> And then I out colossal that one with my biggest hit called The uh, Halls of Matsumazuma. <laughs> well, I guess uh, those pictures haven't been released yet because I don't recall seeing them. Oh, they'll be out any day now. Oh, yeah, as soon as the film comes back from the drugstore. 
Well, gentlemen, uh, while I'm greatly honored by this offer, I can't see why you want me for these pictures. I don't know anything about acting. Well, that's all right. There's a lot of fellas out in Hollywood in the same boat you is. They're getting along fine. <laughs> You'll fit perfect in our next picture, a stupendous and colossal musical with all-star and technicolor cast. Yeah, the picture's going to set us back over $300. Yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, why don't you, uh, get on the train right now and go out to Hollywood? The contract will be waiting for you there. Well, this is a great opportunity. Well, now, gentlemen, excuse me. I'll get ready for Hollywood. Yeah, of course, me and Mr. Brown here can't get there for a couple of days. One of the biggest theaters that we own here in New York's having trouble. Yeah, that's right. The popcorn machine is spraying too much butter. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. I'll get ready. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. Hmm, that was a funny one. Now, I'll get Sapphire on the phone right away and tell her the whole story. Hello, Sapphire? Yeah, this is your cousin Harry. Your husband was just up here. Well, I recognized him from the picture you showed me. Yeah. Well, I think he must have discovered that I'm trying to get him a job because he's trying to get me out of town. Yeah, well, anyway, I think I've been successful in getting a job lined up for him. Say, can you meet me right away? Fine. I'll tell you what you do. You leave home now. <laughs> Well, come on, Andy. Walk down the street with me. Yeah, okay. You know, Andy, we sure put one over on that guy Smith, didn't we, boy? Oh, yeah, he's stupid, all right. He going to Hollywood and don't even know what studio to report to. No. <laughs> he might end up at Warner Brothers, MGM, or that other studio out there, Lockheed. <laughs> hey, uh... Wait a minute. What, what's the hurry, Kingfish? Well, I called up home a few minutes ago, and there's no answer there, Andy, and I know stuff I... Getting my supper ready, because it's after 8 o'clock here. Yeah. Yeah, what you stopping for here? Oh, I just stopped them here in front of this television store. They got all the sets on in the window. Yeah, well, that ain't no good, Andy. You can't hear nothing through that window. Yeah, but you can see plenty. What do you mean? Hey, look, Kingfish. They got the same program on they had the other night. And look there in the center of the screen. There's Sapphire sitting in the restaurant with that same Mr. Smith again. Holy smokes, how you like that brazen hussy? Look at her there. She's two-timing me on every set in the window there. Look. This thing with Sapphire is going too far. I hope Calhoun, my lawyer, can help me. Oh, excuse me, Calhoun. Is you busy here? No, come on in, Kingfish. Yeah, thank you, sir. You know, I was just sitting here thinking about a client of mine who went to the death house last week. Sure enough. Yeah, during the trial, I kind of figured he was going to get the chair. So I got an idea. Uh-huh. I started building up a resistance against electricity. <laughs> well, what did you do? Well, I started out giving him shocks to a 25 volts. And every day I increased it till they could take 3,000 volts without batting an eye. When I got through, he was immune to electricity. Yeah, well, how did it turn out? Not so good. They hung him yesterday. <laughs> well, the reason I come to see you, Calhoun, is something terrible done happened to me. Yeah. I was on my way home to supper when I looked in the window in the television shop there, and all of a sudden there, on the television screen was Sapphire with another man. Oh, I tell you, it was an awful thing when I looked at that screen and see my wife's face. Yeah, especially on the empty stomach. <laughs> Look, Calhoun, what can I do to save my marriage? That what I have well, to... now, the best thing to do is play on a sympathy. You know, do something desperate like running away. Then she'll feel so sorry for us, she'll beg you to come back. Yeah, but I ain't got no money to run no place. Well, then you have to fake it. I say, why don't you go up to Andy's room and hide out and pretend you done run off to some dangerous, far-off place? Yeah, that's a good idea. Have you ever tried anything like that? Oh, sure. I had a fight with a girlfriend once, and I decided to teach her a lesson. I run away and let her suffer. I let her suffer for two long years. <laughs> then I figured out when she'd had enough punishment, I come back and went up to her house, rung the doorbell, and throwed my arms around her and give her a great big kiss. Yeah, well, what happened? Her husband punched me in the nose. <laughs> Say, Kingfish, how long do you think you're going to have to hide out here in my room? Well, like I told you, Andy, just till Sapphire comes to her senses. 
You know, Anne, I really fixed it, though. I left a note saying that I had run off and joined the French Foreign Legion in Africa. Yeah, that ought to make her sit up and take notice. Yeah, I just read another letter here, sort of a follow-up to the first one. <laughs> Say, that one looked awful beat up to me. Yeah, well, I want to make her think it come from the Sahara Desert, you see, so I kind of sprinkled some sand on it. and <laughs> Then I took it over to the zoo and reached in between the barbs and, and kind of rubbed it up and down on a camel there to give it an authentic uh, smell, you see. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good idea, all right. Uh, read me the thing, will you, King Fish? Well, I uh, start off here, I say, uh, my dear, sweet, darling, double-crossing wife. <laughs> As I sit here on the sand dune in this 180-degree heat, listening to my blood boil, <laughs> I thought I'd drop you this little note. Yeah, that sounds like a good start. You sitting there sizzling like a pressure cooker. Mm-hmm. Uh, boy, that ought to get her sympathy, all right. Then I goes on to say, tomorrow we is going into battle. I has a sneaking suspicion that they consider this a dangerous mission. They are sending us into battle with coffins strapped on our backs. <laughs> she ought to be blubbing her eyes out right at this point. Yeah, I finish up here by saying, honey, this is farewell. The Foreign Legion is the toughest outfit in the world. The captain just told us that if you live long enough to get a discharge, they shoot you as for being a coward. <laughs> I must cut this letter short because an Arab just put a bullet through my head. <laughs> Signed your bleeding husband, George. Yeah, well, that's a good letter, all right. Yeah, and I want you to deliver it to her, and when you give it to her, tell her that if she's ready to forget the other man and make up with me, I can make it back from the Sahara in time for supper. Would you tell her? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Kingfish. I tell you, I'll get right on over there. Uh, who's there? Holy smokes, it's a battle axe. Yeah. Let me get under the bed here, quick. Yeah, hurry up, hurry up. Okay, eyes under the bed. Hand the letter in, and don't forget eyes in the foreign legion. Yeah. Andy, as you seen George, he didn't come home last night, and I got a letter saying he didn't run off to the foreign legion. Yeah, that's right, Sapphire. Right now he's sitting on a sandy dude with a coffin on his back. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Andy. What's George's shoes doing sticking out from under your bed? Uh, well, 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 you see, uh... Uh, he was in such a hurry that he left him. He must have been in a hurry. He left his feet in him, too. <laughs> George Stevens, come out from under that bed. All right, I'm coming, I'm coming. George, what's the meaning of this? I demand an explanation. You demand an explanation. I demand an explanation. I see you on the television sitting with that man in the restaurant. Yeah, two days in a row. You shut up. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> You've been acting so well. Funny. Ain't that enough reason to be acting? Well, I might as well tell you. That was just my cousin Harry, and I was trying to talk him into giving you a job. Jonah. Yes, his company done opened a big office here in Harlem, and with that process server on your trail, we just had to have some money from someplace. How you like that? And all the time, I thought you was going out with another man. Oh, George, how could you? Honey, I'm so happy. I don't know what to do. Wait a minute. I do know what to do, too. We is going to have a celebration. I is going to take you out to dinner. Oh, George, that's wonderful. The first time since 1927. Oh, honey, but you deserve it. Got any money? <laughs> It's so nice of you to bring me out to supper like this tonight. Is there any special reason you brought me here to this restaurant? Well, this is the place you come with your cousin Harry. And a lot of people saw you on television. I figured that if they could see us here together on the television, they wouldn't get the wrong idea, you see. Oh, I see what you mean, George. You know, I really got a kick out of being here tonight, special before dinner when they turned the television camera on our table. And just think of all the people who saw us here tonight. Oh, television is a wonderful thing. Mm-hmm. Maybe someday we'll get one. Yeah, television is a wonderful thing. Mr. Stevens? Yeah, I was George Stevens. I had given up hope ever finding you, but here's your summons. Television is a wonderful thing. <laughs> and now, here's your Rexall family druggist. Don't miss Rexall's big full-page ad in the current issues of Life, Look, Collier's, The Saturday Evening Post, and Country Gentleman. You'll find a regular gold mine of drugstore values. Yes, exactly 67 separate, top-quality Rexall products. 
Everything from facial tissues to vitamins, from toothpaste to stationery, and all of them wearing the kind of prices you don't mind paying. Remember, check Rexall's full-page ad in the current issues of Life, Look, Collier's, The Saturday Evening Post, and Country Gentleman. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, to visit your friendly Rexall drugstore. Good night. See you next Sunday. Be sure to be with us next Sunday at the same time when your Rexall druggists will again present The Amos and Andy Show. The Amos and Andy Show is written by Joe Connolly, Bob Mosier, and Bob Ross. Stay tuned for the Edgar Berg and Charlie McCarthy program, which follows immediately over most of these stations. Ken Nile speaking. This program is transcribed. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.